Hey, hello everyone and welcome to our penultimate session of Alt Legal Connect. In case you've forgotten, I am Bree Van Til. I'm the Director of Education here at Alt Legal and the Master of Ceremonies for Alt Legal Connect. Um, let's play our cutesy little... As a reminder, please don't be a jerk to anybody. And if anybody's being a jerk to you, let us know. Hasn't been a problem. I'm pretty sure we can last the next hour without it being a problem at all, which makes me super proud of you. All right, thank you so much. Um, and welcome to creating a client-centered law firm. Um, as with everything else, feel free to use the chat in whichever platform you're in. If you have a question for Jack, please use at presenter so that we can make sure to get that over to him. Um, and this session has been brought to you by our generous sponsor, Clio, who may or may not be related to this talk. Um, but I am super glad to introduce our speaker, Jack Newton, who we're, we're really thrilled and honored to have here. Um, he is the CEO and co-founder of Clio and a pioneer in the cloud-based legal technology. Um, Jack has spearheaded efforts to educate the legal community on the security, ethics, and privacy issues surrounding cloud computing, and he's become a nationally recognized writer and speaker on these topics. Jack co-founded and is president of the Legal Cloud Computing Association and is the author of the client-centered law firm. If you haven't bought it, do. Jack has been recognized as EY's Entrepreneur of the Year, and Clio has been recognized by many national and international by any ugh, many national and international awards for its culture management, customer support, and rapid growth rate. All right, Jack, it's all you. Take it away. All right, thanks, Bree, for that wonderful introduction, and excited to be presenting the client-centered law firm. Uh, with with all of you. Um, so thanks for joining today. Um, honored to be uh, invited to uh, the inaugural Alt Legal Connect. Uh, and uh, by uh, all measures, the conference has been a huge success. So uh, I, I know how challenging running a conference is. So hats off to uh, the team for, uh, for running such a, a successful conference. The other thing I learned uh, a couple of weeks ago with ClioCon is running a virtual conference is actually harder than running a physical conference. So big, big kudos to uh, the team and what they've accomplished over uh, the last few days with this conference. So let's let's jump into the client-centered law firm, and uh, I'll, I'll describe you know a little bit about why I'm so passionate about this this topic, and. You know, Bree mentioned in my my intro that I I run Clio, and maybe I'll do a quick intro just to to set the stage a little bit. And you know, my experience and background is in running Clio, which is a cloud based practice management system. It's the most widely used cloud based practice management system in the world. In fact, it's the most widely used practice management system in the world. Full stop. Um, and I've been building this company for the last twelve years. And over the course of the last 12 years, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of leading law firms, almost you know, in, in a way that uh, McKinsey or Bain might work with really well-run businesses. And, and I've been able to recognize some of the common threads around what makes some law firms more successful and what separates the law firms that thrive from the ones that seem to be struggling and really, what I ended up landing on and reflecting back on, you know, when I when I started writing this book, the the decade plus of experience that I have, what I realized was that the the common thread in what I see in so many of the law firms that are well run is this concept of being client centered, and what I've done in this book and what I'll do in this presentation is really try to convey some of the common themes that that I've seen in terms of the actual behaviors that I see in these firms. But more importantly, I want to motivate why being client-centered is so important. 
Um, if you want to reach out to me, uh, there's obviously the chat where you can feel free to ask a question during my session here. But if you want to reach out afterwards, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at jackacleo.com, jack underscore newton on Twitter or newtonian on Instagram. Um, and, and before we dive into the presentation, I'd love to just share, uh, you know, a little bit of an anecdote about the, the book itself. And as, as Bree mentioned, this book's available uh, for sale. There's, uh, it's available on Amazon. There's a, a physical paperback. There's a hardback. There's uh, an audiobook version uh, available now as well, in addition to a Kindle-based version. So I will go through a lot in this presentation, but if you're feeling like you want to dig a little bit more on any of the concepts I talk about today, this book uh, is available for you as a reference. I would also encourage you, by the way, um, to uh, to share out any interesting findings you hear, anything that resonates with you over the course of this presentation or while you're reading the book, um, and use the hashtag uh, client-centered law firm, and you'll you'll see uh, a bunch of activity related to, to that on, uh, on Twitter and Instagram as well. Um, I want to share to start a cute anecdote about the cover artwork for the book. Um, I, I was really struggling to land on a cover design that uh, I was going to be really passionate and, and happy with. And uh, Danielle Giroux, our, our creative director, asked me one day uh, when we we're you know brainstorming over this and running into a lot of brick walls. Uh, she, she said, why don't you get your, your daughter, who I'd previously shared was, was really into artwork and design, why don't you get your daughter to, to draw a circle that we can use for the cover of the book? So I went home um, that night and got Isla to draw uh, a circle on her, her art pad, which Danielle then uh, digitized and incorporated into uh, the cover artwork for, uh, for the book. So um, cool, cool story about the you know, kind of personal touch uh, of, the, uh, of the artwork in the, uh, in the book, and it makes Isla super happy when I uh, opened up the book when it was first published and showed her her name and the copyright acknowledgments for the, the cover design. Um, and by the way, it also made my two sons that weren't involved in that uh, a little bit jealous, but uh, that's a different story. But there's the book. And as I mentioned, what I'll try to do in the next 53 minutes or so is convey the essence of the book, but ultimately I, I want to spark something in you, hopefully, that gets you to change the way you think about the delivery of legal services and offers a new perspective on how we might redesign and redeploy uh, the way that we do legal services in a really foundational way. And I do think of the client-centered uh, revolution as being truly a revolution that, that allows us to, in a really profound way, rethink how we deliver legal services. And by the way, I know I'm also giving this talk against a backdrop of, uh, you know, an economy that's been ravaged by COVID-19 and uh, a consumer base and a, a business base that has been, that number one has uh, a, a huge number of legal issues that need resolved, but are, are also equally uh, less able to pay for those services than they've ever been in the past. So we have this very unique market environment that we need to navigate over the course of the next months and, and even years that will, will be a, a direct or indirect result of COVID-19. And I, I think this is the catalyst for us to really profoundly rethink how we're delivering legal services. When I talk about being client-centered, I, I really want to divide this, this talk and the concept into three parts that motivate why I think being client-centered is so important. Um, I'll first talk about the age of experience um, and, and motivate why we think being client-centered is so important, why I think being client-centered is so important. I'll then move on to talking about what is specifically involved in building a client-centered law firm. And then I'll conclude with some practical, almost workshop-y type advice on how you can put some of the lessons I've talked about um, to work. So let's first talk about the age of experience, a term that 
I like to refer to the, the overall trend that we're seeing happen in the marketplace right now is the consumerization of legal services. This is a really important concept. What I borrow from here is the concept of consumerization of IT or information technology that some of you might be familiar with. And this is just the concept that when the iPhone first came out, we saw users, business users and, and consumers alike get used to this seamless, painless interface on the iPhone and other software they were starting to use in their homes, like Dropbox, for example. And they saw how easy to use and intuitive the software could be could be for, for their personal needs. And then they started applying pressure to their workplaces and, and basically asked the question, why is the software that I need to use to do my job so horrible and so antiquated? Why do I need to use this crummy mobile device rather than my iPhone to do my job? Um, and you might remember, you know, as quaint as it seems now, even this BYOB trend or BYOD trend around bringing your own device uh, to, to work. And that was all motiva motivated by people's expectations based on their consumer experiencing, shifting their expectation of what work life looked like. And this over the last 20 years has driven uh, a massive and profound change in how IT looks for companies. Exactly the same pattern, exactly the same playbook is playing out in legal services where consumers, when I say consumers throughout this presentation, I wanna emphasize that I'm talking about the consumers of legal services, whether they are uh, individual consumers or business consumers, whether this is you know kind of civil facing or, or corporate work, the, the message is the same, which is that the consumers of legal services are experiencing other experiences. They're touching different experiences that are reshaping what their expectations of professional service delivery looks like. And this includes legal service delivery. Let's look at a few examples, even something as, as basic as a, a coffee, which you might view as the most commodified experience out there. This is just a cup of joe to get you through the day. Starbucks has really succeeded in separating themselves from the pack not by necessarily having a better cup of coffee. In fact, many would, would argue that it's an inferior cup of coffee in a lot of ways uh, to their competition, but they've surrounded it in an experience that is uh, superior to their, to their competitors. And that's why people choose Starbucks is for the predictability and the experience they offer. Um, Pre-COVID, this used to be primarily also about the, the in coffee house experience, this idea that you're bringing the experience of an Italian coffee shop to the United States and beyond. But they've also started to refine that into a better experience in the digital world. I know for me personally, uh, if I'm out and about buying a coffee these days, I'm opting for a Starbucks because they've got the convenience of a digital app that makes it completely painless for, the, for me to order my coffee and get in and out of that store without having to to line up or wait. And this is, this is for them a massive competitive competitive differentiator. And if we just look at the common thread that the breakout companies of the 2010s and the 2020s and beyond have in common, it is all about the experience that they deliver and the fact they're able to make this experience effortless. If we look at Airbnb as an example, uh, they made what was you know, an extremely friction filled experience of booking a vacation rental something that anybody can do with just a few taps of their smartphone. Uber has made hailing a cab famously lower friction than, it, uh, than it's ever been in the past. Amazon has made purchasing goods and getting goods delivered more painless than it's ever been. Um, and you know, a really important takeaway lesson, and, and, and this might be one of the most important slides in my presentation, is that this comes from uh, a, a data-driven study from the Consumer Experience Bureau. The important takeaway here is that when we do studies and ask consumers what do they care about most and what drives long-term loyalty from a consumer, it is in fact this effortless experience that drives long-term loyalty. And contrary to many of our intuitions, what does not drive uh, loyalty and return business is delighting the customer with something that exceeds their expectations. 
So the old maxim I know that we hear all the time in, in legal and elsewhere that you should under promise and over deliver is actually really misguided advice. What you're further ahead doing is actually promising and delivering exactly what you promised when you promised it. And as you can see from this, this curve, the reality is that there's rapidly diminishing returns uh, for consumer loyalty when you do something to really delight and surprise. What do consumers value instead? They value effortless experiences. They, they value the overall experience more than they do being surprised or delighted by you somehow exceeding their expectations in the delivery of your work product. The other important backdrop to this when it comes to meeting expectations, by the way, is that there's a lot more work to be done here than the average lawyer thinks. What we've been commissioning at Clio over the course of the last five years is really in-depth consumer survey that we use as an input to our legal trends report, which is an annual report. Uh, we actually just published uh, the 2020 version of this report a couple of weeks ago. If you Google legal trends report, it's available for, for free. And I encourage you to download and, uh, and read, especially the 2018, 2019, and 2020 editions of this report, which really go in depth on exploring what are some of the gaps between client expectations and lawyer expectations when it, when it comes to consumer preferences. And put another way, if we ask lawyers to guess at what consumer expectations were, or, or are, what would those expectations be? Where would the gaps be? And it turns out there's actually a massive gap between what client expectations actually are and what lawyers believe those ex expectations to be. Just to give you a few examples of what this looks like, uh, and this is from the 2018 Legal Trends Report. When we ask lawyers, how would consumers prefer to learn about the core legal aspects of their case? You can see here that we have uh, a few modalities of communication, uh, in-person meeting, phone-based meeting, email-based meeting, um, and, and other mapped out here. Lawyers think that consumers really want to do this by phone or by email. And consumers, on the other hand, you can see, have a vast preference for having this interaction in person. And for question after question in this survey, when it comes to describing the facts or details of a situation, when it comes to making appointments, when it comes to getting status updates on a case, when it comes to signing, viewing, or sharing uh, documents, we see this massive disconnect between lawyer expectations and consumer expectations. And if we go all the way back to our slide about meeting consumer expectations, step number one is obviously understanding what those expectations are. And put really simply, I think what we see in the legal market today is lawyers doing a really poor job of guessing what consumer preferences are. And, and consumers and lawyers just kind of go like this. And, and that's a massive opportunity for the lawyers that are willing to listen and do the discovery to really deliver legal services in a way that consumers want to receive them. And differentiating yourself in the marketplace is as simple as doing that. I also want to motivate why being client-centered is so important by, by first talking about not, the, not only the change of mind that we need to, to start realizing with this age of experience motivating the change, but also through outlining a massive market opportunity that exists for lawyers that, that figure out how to be more client-centered in their legal service delivery. And let me walk through the opportunity and, and just how enormous I think it is. I, I talked in a previous slide about some of the examples of the, the, the Airbnbs and the, the Ubers of the world that are really disrupting the, the spaces they're in. And I, I wanna provide a slightly different take on what I think many of us have heard at, you know, as a little bit of a, a trope almost when we're talking about how lawyers need to innovate and how lawyers need to think about delivering legal services in a different way. And we, we often hear the, the, do you want to be Netflix or do you want to be Blockbuster um, analogy as uh, um, 
as almost a motivating tool to think about how urgently you need to shift your, your business model. And the narrative is certainly that Netflix killed Blockbuster or that Uber killed the taxi industry or that Airbnb killed the hotel industry uh, or that the Amazon Kindle killed physical book sales. But if you actually go one level deeper and analyze what really happened with all of these businesses, there's actually a much more interesting story to be told. When we look at Netflix and Blockbuster, the interesting thing that, that happened is look, look at the yellow line of Blockbuster's revenue. And obviously uh, that, that went to zero in around the year 2010. Um, and Netflix in the meantime uh, has grown to uh, today uh, over an $18 billion a year business. The important point is, is not that Netflix caused Blockbuster to go bankrupt. They were certainly a catalyst and one of the nails in Blockbuster's coffin. But the reality is, is number one, Blockbuster in a lot of ways uh, caused its own demise, demise by being not customer centered, by being customer hostile, in fact, and being overly profit centered uh, and over self, uh, very self-centered in how it thought about delivering services to uh, to its customers. Uh, in fact, it was a, a punitive late fee that Reed Hastings received on a rental of Apollo 13 from Blockbuster that made him think there's got to be a better way and led him to actually found Netflix. But the more interesting story here is, is that Netflix, by being very client-centered in its delivery model, and thinking in an innovative way, didn't just accelerate the demise of Blockbuster, but it actually created a business that is many times larger than Blockbuster's business ever was. They actually created a market that was bigger than Blockbuster at its peak. And Netflix continues to grow on an annual basis. There's no end in sight for how big and successful Netflix can be while Blockbuster you know, is, is completely irrelevant. And the same story plays out for each of the industries that we might have a very you know, simplified view of what that progression looked like. The, the truth behind the ride hailing apps like Uber um, and Lyft is that they did not actually cause the demise of the taxi industry. They certainly impacted it and, and, and consumed some of that market share but they've actually increased the total size of the monthly rider market across both taxis and ride hailing services. There's more people than ever that are able to get around without their own car, thanks to services like, Air, uh, Air, uh, like Uber and Lyft. Similarly, Airbnb did not cause the demise of the hotel industry. What we've seen is they actually tapped into a new part of demand, people that previously were not traveling, that all of a sudden are able to travel thanks to the new types of accommodations and new affordability levels of some accommodations that Airbnb has been able to unlock for them. So what we're seeing is that people are traveling more than they ever have thanks to uh, Airbnb and the additional supply they brought to the market. And finally, book sales, book sales show a very similar pattern where interestingly, the more physical books that you sell someone actually correlates with a higher number of ebook sales to that same individual. What happens is you take friction away from the book reading experience and people start reading more in general. They start reading both more ebooks and more physical books. So what does this have to do with legal? This is, I, I think, maybe one of the most important concepts to, to internalize, to understand just how gigantic this opportunity is, uh, which is that by being client-centered, we have the opportunity to unlock an enormous latent legal market. When we look at the U.S. legal market, it's a market where 77% of people with legal issues did not receive legal assistance from a lawyer. This is from the, the World Justice Project. And this is, by the way, a, a half trillion dollar a year market in the US alone. So it's a massive market with enormous opportunity 
with right now over three quarters of the demand in this market uh, going unaddressed by lawyers. And what we hear so often is lawyers thinking about the zero sum game that is winning the business that exists above the waterline, the 23% of the legal market whose needs are actually being serviced by lawyers today. But they, they miss the fact that there's this gigantic uh, opportunity below the waterline waiting for lawyers to figure out how to tap into an alternative delivery model to actually service these needs. And this, this really is the, the, the heart of the, the client-centered law firm thinking, which is let's go after this latent legal market. And to go after the latent legal market, we need to apply a, a startup concept that, that some of you that work with startups might be familiar with. It's this concept that was uh, popularized by Mark Andreessen, the, one of the founders of Andreessen Horowitz, um, you know, in the early 2000s. And it's this concept of product market fit. And, and the concept is really simple. If you think about a Venn diagram, anyone developing a product is hopefully developing a product that somehow meets the needs of a market that is willing to pay something for that product. And if we look at legal service delivery as a product and, and the market of people that have legal problems that that product might help them solve, what this World Justice Project data tells us is that if you're an entrepreneur uh, building this product, you'd, you'd have some early traction. You've got some part of the market whose needs are being addressed, but you have a vast portion of the market whose needs are not being addressed. And that is why being client-centered um, is so important. We can improve the product market fit between legal services and consumers that need those legal services. We can improve access to justice for everyone by succeeding in this mission. And we can make lawyers happier and more successful as a result. Uh, and we can make cl clients similarly happier and more successful and more satisfied with their outcomes as a result of applying this thinking as well. So I truly believe being client-centered is win-win-win for lawyers, for clients, and for access to justice. And it is an enormous opportunity for the law firms that, that want to embrace this type of thinking. Now let's outline, let's start getting into some of the specifics of what being client-centered looks like. I wanna make a really important point, which is being client-centered does not mean putting your clients first. And you sometimes hear the distillation of being client-centered being described as, well, you just put your clients first, you put them ahead of everything. And the problem I have with that framing is that obviously putting your clients first implies that you're putting something else second and third and fourth. And that could be your own well-being, your own livelihood. That could be the profitability of your law firm. That could be the, uh, the happiness of your paralegals and support staff. And the reality is that by being truly client-centered, you can actually drive this win-win-win that I described earlier and make no compromises. And in fact, have this pay off in a way that is um, powerful for, for everyone and beneficial for everyone. And this should be no surprise, at the heart of being client-centered is not putting your client first, but putting them at the center of everything you do and the way that you think about your law firm. And that everything in your law firm should orbit around your client and should come from a place of deep empathy with what your client's needs are. So I talked at the beginning of the presentation, you know, the, the fact of the matter is everything about being client-centered really distills down to meeting your client's expectations. I, I talked about that curve where there's the rapidly diminishing returns for exceeding client expectations. I also talked about the chasm between client expectations and, uh, and, and lawyer expectations. And, and how do you reconcile that? Well, you need to do research. You need to understand what your clients want as step one. And step two is giving your clients exactly what they want. Easier said than done. So what I talk about in the book is a few frameworks that you can apply to 
help understand what your clients really want so that you can better design the services you're delivering to your clients. One of the concepts uh, or frameworks that I present in the book uh, is the Jobs to be Done framework by Clayton Christensen, who is a phenomenal thinker. He actually unfortunately passed away uh, last year. So the, the late and great Clayton Christensen, who described this Jobs to be Done framework. And uh, he developed this framework while at Harvard Business School. And uh, one of the projects he was hired to work on uh, while at, at Harvard was a study that that McDonald's uh, actually re retained him to help solve, and this I think is one of the best examples of, you know, understanding your clients and calibrating your services to their needs. McDonald's came to Clayton and said, "We don't understand why, but we we sell a surprising number of milkshakes first thing in the morning. You know, while people are." on their commute to work, they're buying a lot of milkshakes and, and we want to understand why and we want to understand if we can grow this business. So they were seeing some success, they just didn't understand what was driving it. And, and, and Clayton and his team went to work and, and, and researched why, why these people were buying, why the clients were buying uh, milkshakes in the morning and discovered a, a few traits. And, and the jobs to be done framework is, best thought of as if you were hiring a product to do a job and you had a job description for that product, what would that job description say? What is the job you're hiring this product to do? And in the case of this milkshake, the job to be done, Clayton discovered is, is a few things. Number one, they found that these people were early morning commuters that were looking for a snack, something that would give them calories to fuel their day, but they weren't hungry enough to, to buy a full breakfast. So they wanted something that was, you know, a way of filling them up a little bit. They also wanted something that would kill some time. So they, they wanted something to pass by a longer than average commute uh, was, was another trait these people had in common. And they didn't want something that they could just eat quickly and, and, and throw out. They they wanted something that would last you know 20, 30 minutes if they uh, if they kind of dragged out the milkshake consuming process long enough, and so McDonald's now understanding that the job to be done was basically to be this slightly filling but drawn out meal that people with longer than average commutes were hiring the milkshake to do. They made a few changes to how they delivered milkshakes. They, knowing that people were going in and out, only buying a milkshake and wanting to be as quick as possible, moved the milkshakes up to the front of the store. Uh, the milkshake machines up to the front of the, I guess, behind the, the counter um, food production part of, of McDonald's so that the people taking the order could just turn around, grab the milkshake and give it to the customer. They also increased the thickness of their milkshake so that it lasted longer. And with those two simple changes, McDonald's was able to help drive milkshakes, milkshake sales up by seven times, if you can believe it, making their milkshake machines more visible, more readily accessible, and a thicker formula that really met the needs of these early morning commuters. That's the job to be done framework in a nutshell on how you can apply it to a fast food business. And you might be wondering, what, what does any of this have to do with my law practice? Well, it's a great example of how client-centered thinking can open your mind to what you actually need to do to your product. McDonald's could have guessed at a million things it could have done to its milkshake. It could have introduced new flavors. It could have introduced bigger sizes. It could have introduced all sorts of changes, maybe a less thick recipe. But without understanding the job that its customers are being hired, it would have been stabbing in the dark. And Lawyers have a similar opportunity. And even if we look at something that is foundational to law practice, or at least so many law practices, and that's the billable hour model, you know, we should ask, was this ever done with a jobs to be done framework kind of mindset? We, we had Seth Godin speak at the Clio Cloud Conference a few weeks ago. And one of the things he commented on that I just uh, laughed at and loved because it was so on point is he pointed out nobody ever wakes up in the morning with a billable hour problem. Nobody ever wakes up in the morning saying, you know what, I've got a problem and the way I'm gonna solve that problem is going and buying and 
hour of somebody's time. No, people wake up with problems that need solved and want partners to help them solve that problem. And that's really, I think, the, the fundamental shift that, that we need to think about in the legal industry because the billable hour model at a really foundational level is not something that is client-centered. It is lawyer-centered, but the irony is that it's actually not all that great for lawyers either. It's maybe the most predictable and easy way to think about structuring your fees, um, but it's by no means best for you or best for your clients. You know, very briefly, Ed Walters uh, gives this uh, this anecdote uh, or this this analogy that I I love talking about. You know, some of the faults of the billable hour, just building on I think this this concept that. That Seth talked about. If if you saw a lobster on the menu at a high end restaurant with market price next to it, imagine asking the waiter, you know, what's what's market price for lobster right now, and and imagine if the waiter's response was, well, I, I'd love to tell you, but I I can't until you actually order the lobster, and then I'm gonna ask my fisherman to to number one catch the lobster, package it up send it by truck to the restaurant, then have my chef prepare it. Um, and we'll have to account for some time in terms of actually bring it to your table. But once I'm able to tally up all of the time and all of the costs associated with that delivery of the lobster, you know, I'll, I'll be able to tell you the final price when I deliver your, your bill at the end of the meal. You know, no one would ever order that lobster off the menu. And yet that's the, the prevailing model for, uh, for legal service delivery. I'll talk about a few alternatives to that model in a moment, but I also want to talk about why client experience is so important to drive the flywheel of growth for your law firm. Now, the flywheel is a concept that Jim Collins introduced in his book, Good to Great. And interestingly, he actually helped Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, realize um, what he was building at Amazon was a great example of the flywheel and how powerful it can be in a business context. And when we think about this flywheel, it, it, it's based off of the, you know, the physical flywheel, which, you know, if you, if you think about the mechanical form of the flywheel, it takes a lot of energy to get the flywheel going, but the idea is that it's an energy store and that it has its own almost self-perpetuating energy once you put that energy into getting it going and keep it going with some incremental uh, amount of uh, energy over time. What, what Amazon has is a flywheel where by virtue of driving more customers to its site, by having the best customer experience and drawing more customers to its site, it has more traffic, which in turn draws more sellers to its marketplace, which helps it drive having the best selection for customers, which in turn drives more customers to its site. Um, and in the meantime, it's able to continuously drive down its cost structure and deliver its services more and more efficiently. So you look at this flywheel that Amazon's been building for 20 years now, and you realize at this point, they're, they're virtually unstoppable. They've done such a good job of focusing on client experience that they've got this self-perpetuating machine that will just keep growing and keep amplifying its own success. And again, you might be asking, what's this got to do with a law firm? And on a much smaller scale, law firms have a very similar flywheel. When we look at legal trends report data, we see that most law firms get new clients through word of mouth or through referrals or through online review sites. These are the, the main ways that consumers are getting connected with lawyers. Put a slightly different way, they're looking online and searching for a particular lawyer in a particular practice area and choosing the lawyer with the best reviews, or they're asking their friends or family or colleagues who they'd recommend to help them with a specific legal issue. And this is where delivering an amazing client experience, where being client-centered in the way that you deliver legal services is a huge way to stand out from the crowd and a huge way to feed your own flywheel of growth because you'll help drive more satisfied clients out into the world, telling their friends, writing online reviews, which in turn will draw more clients to your law firm, which in turn will help you drive more great experiences, more client-centered experiences, and help build this flywheel for your law firm. 
And by the way, just like Amazon, you can continue iterating on building a better machine, building a better process to actually deliver those legal services so that you can do it at larger scale with higher efficiency. Another really core concept to being client-centered is that it's actually one of the easiest ways for you to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. And the, the reality is, is, as much as we would like to say our legal deliverable is the best in the market, you know, let, let's use wills and estates as an example, as much as we'd like to say my will is the best one in the market, the reality is, is that actually really hard to prove that. It's really hard to even know that. Um, and number two, you're, you're traipsing all over all sorts of ethics rules by even making that claim. You know, the truth of the matter is for many legal services, as I pointed out, you know, earlier, consumers are looking for good enough. You know, they're, they're looking for something that meets their needs, but they don't necessarily need the world's best will. The reality is though, that they are going to select somebody that is able to deliver a better experience to them. And that is actually a massively easier place to differentiate yourself from your competition is by wrapping everything you do in a better experience. And this expands the total value of your legal deliverable and actually enhances the perceived value of that legal deliverable to your client. But what you're differentiating on is actually not the legal deliverable, what you're, what you're really investing in and delivering on is everything that surrounds that legal deliverable. So let's talk in the next 20 minutes or so about some of the specific ways you can put this thinking uh, to, to work. How do you actually go about building a client-centered law firm? And I wanna highlight a few examples um, to start off with. Now, one example is Kim Bennett, who I know actually uh, spoke on a panel about subscription legal services earlier in this conference. I highlight Kim in my book uh, because you know I've always viewed her as a, a trailblazer and, and she does IP work and business strategy work with a subscription service. And she's able to really effectively package up and price her service offering using a subscription model that meets her client's needs uh, and creates a recurring revenue stream for her. And she's gotten to a point where she's able to get over 75% of her monthly revenue from subscriptions, um, which is an amazing place to be as a business. So many businesses are at a point where they roll over to a new month. It's November 1st, time to start from zero on my build hours for the month. Imagine instead you have 75% of your revenue realized in the books to start with, thanks to subscription customers. That's, I think, an enormous opportunity for the legal market. And Kim is, is a trailblazer in terms of what that looks like. By the way, the other, the other aspect of a subscription model is it can be very resilient to external changes. I had Kim on my Daily Matters podcast uh, a couple of months ago and asked her what the impact of COVID-19 was on her excuse me, subscription revenue. And her answer was basically that it was untouched. And I thought that was incredible because we heard in so many places about businesses and consumers drawing back on legal spend. And I think they do that when they view it as essentially discretionary spend that they could deploy any given month, but they're much, much less likely to cancel a subscription to, to anything, whether that's a, a magazine or, or a, a legal service subscription. And, and Kim's data point bore that out. Um, we have examples of, of folks like Sound Immigration using cloud-based technologies to allow their clients to access their case status in a totally frictionless way from anywhere uh, in the world. We have great examples like Patrick Palace at the Palace Law Firm using chatbots to help automate intake and to help uh, create responsive uh, screening of potential uh, workplace injury claims right from their website. Um, they, they use text messaging to keep their clients in the loop and informed of uh, important changes to their case status. Um, and we have Hello Divorce uh, as another great example of technology-enabled client-centered experiences where if you're doing a, new, a no contest divorce, uh, you can get that performed on Hello Divorce's platform for around 
five hundred dollars. Um, I talked earlier, by the way, about the fact that this can be a win-win-win proposition, and I, I think there's a great example, you know, in the form of Hello Divorce, proving out exactly that. So what's amazing is they're charging hundreds of dollars for a no contest divorce. And this is something that can easily get into thousands of dollars for more traditionally delivered legal services. And what's amazing, if you talk to Erin Levine, the CEO of Hello Divorce, uh, she she shares these, these data points publicly. She shares the fact that the lawyers that work for her behind the scenes of Hello Divorce, the lawyers that are actually powering this, this website and the divorces that are happening through this website, they're making more money doing a higher volume of divorces at this lower price point than they were making doing $15,000 divorces in the old school way of doing divorces. So her lawyers are more successful. Her clients are happier because they've got this effort, effortless experience that is lower cost and a better overall experience thanks to the technology tools that Aaron's deploying. And we're also increasing access to justice. We are seeing more people uh, get divorced, get out of relationships that they can't be in or shouldn't be in for whatever reason that might not have been able to afford that service under the traditional way that legal services were delivered. These are people that were probably in that 77% of legal issues that were sitting below the waterline that are now able to get their legal needs serviced. And I think this kind of thinking can be applied in so many different practice areas. So I wanna talk um, in concrete terms around what becoming client-centered looks like. And I wanna talk about the five values of a client-centered firm. In my book, I try to distill the concept of what being truly client-centered is, is all about and what some of the common traits that I observed across the law firms that I worked with that were truly client-centered. And number one, with, with, a, with a bullet really, I, I think is this concept of being deeply, deeply empathetic to your client's needs really putting yourself in their shoes and understanding what is their challenge and what is the job to be done that they're hiring you for. And I'll use a, a really concrete example of uh, wills and estates again, just, just as an example of how you can apply this thinking. If you're thinking about in, in an empathetic way to your client, when they come in the door and say, I need a will, and you think about the job they're hiring you for, what is the job to be done here? On the surface and the way most wills and estates law firms treat this is this is a transaction. The thing they're looking for is a piece of paper that will be their will and they'll put that in a safe deposit box and everything will be okay. Um, the reality is that the job to be done is actually providing peace of mind to that client. What they're hiring you to do, whether they can articulate this or not, is they're hiring you to help them achieve peace of mind. They want to make sure that their family is gonna be taken care of if something unexpected were to happen to them. And when you understand that fundamental data point, when you understand that's the job to be done, you all of a sudden realize, you know, charging 500 or $1,000 for that will upfront as a transactional thing, and you, you write down the, the will, give them a piece of paper and send them on their merry way and probably never talk to them again, is not actually servicing their need. Uh, it, it, it's not empathetic to what their underlying need is. Uh, and when you do ground up innovative thinking in terms of, well, what kind of service delivery model should be provided here? I think you, you land at some pretty different ways of thinking about wills and estates. You start thinking maybe wills should actually be a subscription. If, if they're looking for peace of mind, they're gonna have an ever-changing life circumstance. They're gonna get married, they're gonna have kids, they might get divorced. There's gonna be a number of things that happen in their life that are gonna, they, they, they might move states. There's gonna be a number of things that will change in their life that need to be reflected in their will. And maybe a subscription that is maybe $50 a year, or $100 a year is the right way to price and package that will. And included in that yearly fee is an interview. Maybe it's an online questionnaire, an email questionnaire I send you every year, just asking you what's changed in your life circumstances, asking you to confirm the details I've got on file for you. And if something's changed, included in that annual subscription 
is going to be a redrafting of your of your will to reflect your new circumstances. And the cool thing about this, the win 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 that I keep talking about, is that the lifetime value of that client to me as a lawyer just went up by an order of magnitude. The amount of money they'll pay me, that they'll happily pay me for the value I'm delivering, by the way, goes up by an order of magnitude. I've also improved my cash flows and have a much more predictable law firm business as a result. And I also have the ability to um, increase access to justice in the sense that there's a lot of clients that could not afford a $500 or a $1,000 will. There is an enormously larger market, a huge market that is able to afford a $50 a year or $100 a year subscription, a five or $10 a month subscription. And that's where you realize that you can actually achieve a better outcome for your business. You can achieve a better outcome for your clients and you can actually improve access to justice. Or as I like to frame it, you can improve product market fit. You can actually help tap into that latent legal market with this kind of thinking. Um, a few other values that I go into in more depth in the book that I'll go through very quickly here is practicing attentiveness, truly being present when you're talking with your client, generating ease with communications. So this is, uh, again, thinking about how do I make communicating with me as easy as possible? That might be an in-person meeting for some clients. That might be a Zoom call for other clients. That might be text messaging for others, but communicating in the medium that they prefer. Uh, demanding that every touch point of your client experience has an effortless experience um, and that you're creating clients for life, that you're really deliberately thinking about feeding this flywheel for your law firm, that you're going to see not only repeat business from that one client, but you're going to see them referring more and more clients to you. You're going to see them leaving positive online reviews for you so people can find you on Google and elsewhere. Um, and another concept that I talk more in depth in the book is the, the concept of the customer journey. This is a tool, and, and we'll get in our last few minutes here to some of the applied tools that you can put to work in your law firm. This customer journey and the customer journey map where you can lay out every touch point your client has with you, all the way from the awareness phase where they're just realizing they have a legal problem to the point they're actually researching the law firms that they might work with and consulting with your law firm in particular. Think about the every step of the client journey and how you can make that uh, as effortless as possible and how you can apply client-centered thinking to every step of that customer journey. Another way this is enormously powerful, by the way, is that the, the customer journey, the client journey that your customers went through in January of 2020 is vastly different than the one they'll be going through in January of 2021. Realize that COVID-19 turned this entire customer journey on its head and that most, if not all of this customer journey in the future is gonna be happening in the cloud. And I talk about the, the two aspects of winning law firms uh, in the 2020s will be all about law firms that are client-centered and law firms that are cloud-based. And I really think that they work hand in hand in the sense that being cloud-based gives you the flexibility with the technology tools to address rapidly changing environments as what, exactly what we've seen with COVID-19. And being client-centered gives you a very clear opinionated take on what that client journey should look like and how you can leverage those cloud-based tools to better meet your clients' needs. Um, I'll, I'll skip over this just in the interest of time and and, and comment on, on, just double down on something I, I commented on earlier, which is if, if this seems overwhelming, if, if, if some of the client-centered work seems like it's gonna be a lot of effort, I, I wanna remind everyone as, as a concluding word of encouragement, you've done the hard work. You've gotten a law degree, you've founded a law practice, you've partnered up or joined a law practice. You're you're in a lot of ways in a great position to succeed and you've done the hard work. Being more client-centered and being more focused on the actual way that you're designing and delivering your legal services is actually in a lot of ways the easy part of the job that the vast majority of the market completely ignores. 
it, it's where being precedent driven does legal a huge disservice is, is lawyers are basically just coasting off of the way that legal services were delivered for the last 50 years. And if you just do something slightly innovative in the way that you're delivering your legal services, there's a massive market opportunity waiting for you. There's massive differentiation to be realized. And there's a massive long-term advantage for you to create. And putting your energy there is where you'll see such a powerful return on investment compared to the investment you might make in trying to make your legal deliverable stand out in some way that might actually be imperceptible to your end client and maybe not valued by your end client as, at all as a result. Um, I know we've got a few minutes left. I wanna quickly see if we have any questions outstanding. Um, and Bree, maybe let me know if there's any specific questions I should I should tackle here. But um, I'll jump into a few specific tactics you can apply to your client-centered law firm. Designing your client-centered law firm can really orbit around eight key steps. One is designing your customer journey map, gathering data on that map. Um, understand what is the current state in your law firm. Define the problem or job to be done that your client is waking up with and hiring you to help solve. Brainstorm solutions. Design a process prototype. And again, I want to emphasize that this can be very lightweight. You don't need to make this a really complex, heavyweight process. You can prototype something in a really simple way and deploy it in your law practice and experiment with how well it works and test how well it works. I'll give you an example. If we're talking about adding text messaging to your law firm, you don't necessarily need to start off employing some huge expensive text messaging platform that you employ in every part of your customer journey. Do what Patrick Pallas did and focus in on one really key aspect of his client journey where he thought text messaging could provide value and experiment with that. That might be, you know, a, a support staff sending individual text ma messages to clients to start with until you automate it, but test on that, iterate on it um, and get that feedback loop going. And that is what, you know, can really help you drive uh, iterative results. I think I want to emphasize that you don't need to boil the ocean. You don't need to try to solve every touch point. You don't need to try to solve um, every aspect of building a client-centered law firm in one step, pick one thing to do, focus in there and be iterative in how you approach it. Um, I also wanna emphasize uh, a couple of key takeaways here in terms of measuring success and assessing success. Uh, I'm a huge Peter Drucker fan, one of the you know original great thinkers around management and he has a, a maxim that we live by at Clio, uh, and that is what gets measured gets managed. Decide what you're gonna measure in your law firm. That might be NPS, for example, net promoter score, to measure how happy your clients are at the end of an engagement with you. And I'd recommend this as a baseline, by the way, for, for everyone. At the end of a matter, ask your clients what their net promoter score, and ask them to comment on why they provided you that score, and measure how that changes over time. I've talked talk to law firms that have been able to get their NPS from zero or even a negative value up into the stratosphere of NPS, which is in the 60 to 70 range, um, just by measuring and iterating on the feedback they're getting. The other Peter Drucker quote I love uh, is that culture eats strategy for breakfast. You need to build a law firm culture from the ground up that is focused on being client centered. And there's uh, enormous opportunity to be an advocate for change, but you need to enroll people in that change and thinking very deliberately about change management uh, is crucial. Um, and I'll, I'll conclude just saying you can increment incrementally, you implement incrementally rather, do things in phases. Um, there's a great story of Dave Brailsford and the, B the British cycling team and how Dave was able to, by focusing on 1% gains on a daily basis, turn this into the losingest team in, in cycling into one of the best cycling teams ever to have walked uh, the face of this earth 
by focusing on what he calls the aggregation of marginal gains, by focusing on 1% improvements. And if you focus on those 1% improvements on a daily basis uh, for a year, you actually, if you compound that, that effort, you are 37 times better at something by the end of the year if you just take that aggregation of marginal gains uh, approach. So that takes me to the end of my time. I hope this has uh, inspired you to think about uh, being more client-centered and to joining the client-centered revolution. Um, I hope this has sparked an interest in you that if you're interested in, in diving in more, please feel free to pick up a copy of the book. And I would love to chat with you if you want to reach out to me at jack at clio.com or on Twitter at jack underscore Newton. And uh, again, thanks for having me uh, and look forward to interacting with some of you over the remainder of the conference. All right. Thank you so very much, Jack. That was incredibly informative. Um, and the the chat was explosive. Again, thank you all so much for, um, for your eager participation. We really appreciate it. Um, I would like you to all please now, um, and there's not a break between between now and our closing remarks. Um, Nehal has just 15 minutes um, to wrap this up and then we'll go to our virtual happy hour where you can socialize and spread more more love in this community. I know how um, I know how much you've been sharing that. So thank you so much, Jack. We really appreciated Thanks this. And everybody else, please go to the schedule um, immediately. If you would, please, we only need 15 more minutes of your time before you can take a break before a virtual happy hour. Um, we will see you there. Thank you so much.